it has been an unprecedented year and um, how in your view how is digitalization affecting and changing your organization and the wider wider maritime sector to lead any international complicated company through a unprecedented pandemic uh, causes some 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 special challenges so i suppose the first thing we should do is to be grateful for the fact that our business, uh, primarily moving a brake bulk, so wood pulp and uh, windmill blades, uh, is still viable. And if we look at uh, the, the standard processes of any shipping company, we have those that are commercial. So with us, we have a joint venture called G2 Ocean. So they have the customer interactions. We have to be able to book cargoes. We have to be able to, to make sales. We have to be able to operate the vessels. And we have the technical operations where in the Greek Star Group, one of the companies is Greek Star, ship management company. Uh, they have to be able to do both the day-to-day -day crew changes uh, and also the maintenance and dry docking. We've been saying that we need to automate and digitalize processes for 10 years. Right? So what happens when you have a pandemic is that suddenly everybody's lined up with the same vision and the vision is survival. The vision is to not go bust and lose your own job. So what we see is not necessarily that the tools are available. We see the velocity of using the tools uh, increases. So specific examples, if I look at G2 Ocean, they've had a blockchain based bill of lading solution for almost two years. But now the MyG2 portal and the use of that tool is uh, exponential because people don't want to have a human interaction to sign papers, right? Uh, if we look at uh, our top line with Greg Green, uh, a company that does uh, IHM inspections and recycling, they have to completely change their business model to do remote working together with, amongst others, the mm -hmm. input class approval, right? So, so actually you're talking about a paradigm shift in the business model because it used to be about human beings traveling and now it's about having the competency and a partner like DMV to do the quality checking of delivering services remotely. And then in ship management, where to start? Uh, you know, dry docking, well, we could never do that remotely, we thought. Uh, and now we've done three uh, on time uh, and on budget. Um, the value of building up good partners over time through the rough and the smooth. For, for Grig, digital is the glue, but really it's the human beings and the ability to enable a paradigm shift in attitudes and mindset that are the real takeaways around digitalization. And that was a very long answer, but I think if we just look at the tools, we miss actually the opportunity and the opportunity is to change people. Sure. Sometimes you should use a crisis to change people. Do you think that digitalization has been accelerated by half a decade during this pandemic? Is that something that you think is approximately right or totally off? I use 10 years because what we see is a mind sh shift uh, change. And that means that instead of having that, uh, you know, both as being a salesperson, very similarly to the team in DMV when I was in Kongsberg Digital, so both in that setting, uh, digitally when you're trying to sell a product the mindset's changed so if it's 10 years or five years i don't know but what i do know is that the customers we are now ready that's the change we understand we get it we need to do it there's no heavy lifting to try and uh, explain the difference between reactive reporting and predictive analytics anymore it's more oh wow yeah we saw that we now uh, understand better our business related to, to budgeting on dry docking after we use these new tools. Uh, let's do that in some other areas, you know, what, who can we talk to? You just have to look at the stock value of tech companies, right? That can deliver uh, solutions which are uh, enablers for remote work. Um, it, it's a good time to be on that side of the table, I think. Many say that uh, in our industry, we are somewhat conservative. We are not moving fast enough. I think your answer so far is is naturally now that we are at, at the you know tipping point that things at least on digitalization is moving fast. But I would like to to ask you on decarbonization of shipping. I mean there is massive criticism in many uh, you know K 
camps, EU, uh, other places, that it's not going fast enough. And, and yet, at the IMO, this is the top uh, priority. And uh, what, what's your view on that? Let's just place the carbon question to the side and, and talk again about human beings. The first question I would ask in such a big change is who is incentivized to be part of that change and who is actually de-incentivized to be part of that change, right? So when we see this vast difference of opinion from the industry, uh, that's also because some of them are going to be negatively impacted by these changes, right? So it's, it's important for us to take our kind of strategic tactical hat on when we talk about this. Um, look, I believe that carbon will be in a sense a, a currency of the future, right? There is, um, there is too much scientific evidence and too much tangible empirical evidence that we're doing harm for us not to take it seriously. The challenge is, how do we do it if it doesn't make financial sense? So the technologies have come and will continue to come. Uh, there will be opportunities to decarbonize uh, in radical and incremental ways, but we need the fundamentals of what the customer will pay and what we can earn on our top and bottom line to support the change. So I guess the most important aspect in this, in this change then, and, and IMO 2030, and beyond is how does the legislation and the both the carrot and the stick support that change? How can we turn it into a business model that, that, that works? A vast majority of trade that's uh, seaborne is of course deep sea, right? So even though we can have completely carbon neutral short sea vessels now, that doesn't solve the grassroots problem, right? So that's a way to test an experiment, maybe to make some money uh, on the technology side, but we need we need uh, the, the politics to support the change. Yeah. Uh, and now we have a change in the United States, which is interesting, and the Paris Agreement, I believe, will be signed again. So that's a good sign, less protectionism and more partnerships and more uh, commonality. I think of carbon as a currency, I think of information and data as a currency as well. So those two currencies we need to think carefully about and how they can be part of our business models moving forward. So picking up on that point, I mean, we talked about the regulators, I mean, US may be coming back into the, the, the climate agreement again. Um, and we also heard that China, Japan, uh, South Korea all have, along with the EU, ambitions. Um, and, uh, and we also see that the wider stakeholders, like the financiers, uh, the, the owners of the cargo are, are putting pressure on the industry. With all of this happening, not only on the regulatory side, but also maybe on the market uh, side, uh, how, how are you, uh, say, adopting to these changes with the, with the strategies that you are putting in place? Starting with the customers, uh, our uh, commercial arm, G2 Ocean, a joint venture with Gearbox, uh, are working very hard to understand the customer needs, their own carbon footprints, you know, make sure that there is a, a, a customer centrality around our carbon plans, right? The customers are starting to ask, which is great. When, when the customers want to be part of the same journey, uh, then you can start making change. In terms of our strategy to meet those, I think, I'm not sure, I don't think we're unique in this, but we've, we've looked at it in two ways, uh, really. We've looked at it in how do we decarbonize and ensure that our existing core business um, is profitable and sustainable. And we've also thought, well, hang on, if we have the knowledge to do this, if we're starting to really uh, be leading edge in some of the technology and the understanding of these, these changes, why don't we look to spin up new business as well? And that's difficult to do from the core. So we started a new business called Grig Edge, where we're specifically looking to see if we can earn some money on that journey of decarbonization and removing plastic from the ocean, actually, as well. Um, because if you look at the Grig's foundations, they have been for a very long time, way before my uh, joining Grig. They've been based on sustainability and ESG and now SDGs. There are foundations, right? So we need to do good and make money 
we need to be able to do both. Um, so I think that in order to succeed on the decarbonization mission, you have to have your strategy in order and you have to have everybody lined up in the organization supporting that and you have to have the customers in focus. So on that journey, we're gonna look at quite disruptive, quite risky, quite exciting business opportunities, not from the core, but from Grig Edge. If you have a complicated problem, you generally have to understand how things are today, the current state, and then you have to look at well, where are we going, and then you have to have a plan that gets you from A to B. Uh, and here, DMV, again, is a tr tremendously important partner on that uh, decarbonization plan, because for us, uh, this is the year that we're already testing technology. We have to see our fleet, what would it look like in 2030? How many of the vessels will we keep? <laughs> How many of the vessels will we retrofit? And if we're going to retrofit, what's the target going to be for us to reduce carbon? That there will not be one solution here. So this is a classic combination of many different solutions and processes coming together to get the reduction that we're looking for. Um, and the retrofitting has to be within a capex, which is acceptable um, to the owners as well. In this world that we are moving into, and especially showing progress on the decarbonization journey, uh, obviously trust will play a major role and you will have probably also quite a bit of green painting uh, and uh, I guess for those uh, like yourselves uh, and others that are actually investing in order to progress on this decarbonization journey, trust and validation of results must be important and thank you again so much Matt for, for taking the time and it was uh, really a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>